the um, Brooklyn Community Board 2 Parks and Recreation Committee. I'm Barbara Zoller Gringer, one of the co-chairs of the committee. Um, we, we always ask our committee members to keep their videos on and when you're presenting as well to keep your videos on and then we, we ask everyone otherwise to be muted. Um, then uh, let's see. If you do have any questions that fall outside of the public comment time, which will be coming later in the program, please type your questions in the chat panel and we will address them as relevant to the matters and as time permits. You may also email the district office at any time with questions. Uh, we are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless of any um, challenges they might have or limitations. If you require an accommodation or you know someone who needs an an accommodation in order to attend, uh, please contact the district office at least 72 hours before a public meeting. Um, I am, uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of my committee members, uh, starting with our, um, let's see, starting with my co-chair to introduce themselves and um, Andrew Lastowetsky. Okay, Candace. Hi, I'm here, Candace Harrison. Okay, uh, Lenny. Yeah, here's Lenny Levinson. And and thank you, Lenny, for taking the minutes tonight, Jennifer. Hello, Jennifer. Uh, Suzanne. Okay, I guess you're muted, Suzanne. Okay, um, Carolyn. Carolyn Hubbard coming on weary. And Dwight Smith. Uh, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we do have a an ambitious uh, agenda. I would like at this point to ask for a motion to approve the agenda from a committee member. Move Suzanne to and Andrew second. Uh, all in favor? Okay, seeing none opposed, um, the agenda is approved. Um, I, I would ask, our th we have three presenters tonight. We're truly <clears throat> blessed with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So I would ask our presenters to try to keep their presentation to 10 minutes, and then we'll have some time for, um, for questions and answers, and hopefully still try to stay within the parameters of our meeting. So we're, we're, our first presentation is um, concerning the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative. And Anna Backus from the Naval Cemetery Landscape, she's the Naval Cemetery Landscape and Stewardship Manager. Anna, you look very familiar to me, but I'm not quite sure about your title. So uh, we're gonna turn this over to you and I'm um, looking forward to what you have to share with us. Uh, thank you. And if uh, I could just introduce our uh, executive director, Terry Carda, she's going to be co presenting with me. And actually, if um, she could be the one sharing her screen, that would be great. That's what we tested earlier. Hello, everyone. Good evening. One second. Thank you. All right, I'm just going back in. Okay, there we go. I assume everybody can see that. Great, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the co-chairs of CB2 and all of the committee members for inviting us to speak with you today. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar with BGI and the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. We have been uh, working with you and supported by you for about two decades now. And admittedly, it has been a while since we've been uh, in front of you. And I'm very happy to be doing so this evening um, because there is, as you're about to see, a lot of exciting updates um, from the last couple of years, this last year in particular, um, and as we look forward to the next year plus toward completion of the Greenway. 
Um, for anybody who's new to, to us or we haven't connected with you previously, Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, or BGI, as you'll hear us say, is a nonprofit organization that's been around for nearly 20 years, uh, based in Brooklyn, and really focused on the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway as an amenity, as an asset, as a vital piece of infrastructure that connects a greener, stronger, healthier Brooklyn. And what is the Greenway? When we talk about the Greenway, we're talking about the route itself, as well as the connected public spaces. So I love that we're with the Parks Committee here this evening um, and really kind of talking about the Greenway as a connector to parks and open space, as well as the waterfront as our, you know, as another kind of park, park type space in New York City. Um, I'll take us through a couple of updates here. Um, so the map on the right depicts the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway in its entirety. It's about 26 miles around uh, the whole borough. Um, there are about 20 miles of greenway that are currently in use. You can see the green segments on the map are in use. The red segments are planned or in progress in some way. Um, and within the last year, there's been an immense amount of progress toward completion and full connection of the greenway. Um, and I'll go through those very quickly. Um, in Greenpoint and Williamsburg, we uh, the new West Street Greenway, where BGI also had an open street throughout this past year. Um, there's a very small but mighty segment that connects Greenpoint and Williamsburg along Franklin Street and K Street. Um, Kent Avenue South um, is of particular interest here, um, you know, right around the Navy Yard on the eastern side of the Navy Yard within uh, Community Board 2. Um, that project is nearing completion. It's already in use um, and is already proven to be extremely popular um, even before the capital work is totally done. Um, similar story around uh, the Navy Yard on the south side of Flushing Avenue. That capital project is still in progress, um, although there um, there's much of that stretch of Flushing Avenue between Navy and uh, Williamsburg Street West that's already being used by people on bikes and pedestrians and so forth, runners, et cetera. Um, there's a segment of Greenway that's being implemented in Dumbo on Water Street. Um, and then kind of further south into Brooklyn, there's a capital project that just broke ground this past fall, the Hamilton Avenue Connector, as it's called, that will connect um, basically Court Street from from Smith and Court along Hamilton Avenue over the bridge down 3rd Avenue on the north part of, uh, Sun of Sunset Park to 29th Street. And there's another capital project that's in motion at the south end of Central Park, the so-called Owl's Head Connector that connects 58th Street down to Owl's Head Park. And then there was recently some improvements and delineation of a greenway made in Bath Beach along the Shore Parkway. So that's a lot to happen within one year, and we are very excited about those developments. Um, and at the same time, we remain focused on the four major gaps of Greenway that remain. Those are in Vinegar Hill, in Red Hook, the crux of Central Park, uh, excuse me, Sunset Park, uh, the middle of Sunset Park, and then there's a very long stretch in South Brooklyn that we're still working on. Um, the one last thing I'll highlight about the Greenway itself before we get to the Naval Cemetery landscape is that throughout the pandemic and even before the pandemic, BGI has been measuring through uh, technology that's in use in other places within the district, um, within the community board. Um, our The sensor um, basically measured spikes in use along the Greenway that for people on bikes at the highs were about five times as high as the busiest days of 2019. So not the average day, but the busiest day of 2019. When we look at the busiest day of 2020, it was about five times greater. That is huge. Um, the use of the Greenway by people on bikes has gone down a little bit, um, but it's still approximately um, nearly three times as great as the 2019 average. Pedestrians, people using the Greenway on foot, um, are, isn't quite as dramatic, but still about double what it was in 2019. 
And I think one thing that I'd like to highlight for you all here this evening is that BGI is undertaking a very is a, a comprehensive user study that will document use of data as well as user demographics over the course of an entire year and spread out across the entire geography, the, the whole 26 mile alignment of the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway. Um, so that we're in the planning stages of that project right now. Um, we anticipate data collection to start in earnest um, early this spring, and then we'll collect data for a year. So we really look forward to coming back to you with, with that information. Um, as it will help all of us better understand, you know, who's using the greenway, for what purpose, why, for how long, how often, um, and importantly, who's not using the greenway and why. Um, so that's the greenway itself. As I said at the outset, you know, we're really about the route as well as green spaces. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anna to talk about the Naval Cemetery landscape. Thanks very much, Terry. And again, hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so like uh, Taya mentioned earlier, I'm the manager of the Naval Cemetery landscape. I also oversee stewardship and greening efforts along the Brooklyn Greenway. Um, and I just want to share a few things about uh, the Naval Cemetery landscape in 2020 and also look ahead to 2021. Um, so the NCL is located along the Greenway on Williamsburg Street West between Kent and Flushing Avenues. We invite all of you to come by and visit. Um, so 2020 was a great year for us, despite the fact that we were closed for about six weeks because of the pandemic. So from about mid-March to early May, we saw our visitation numbers increase by almost a third compared to 2019. Um, we were also able to provide new resources for our visitors. So you're seeing a few examples of that on your screen. We have a new uh, self-guided tour brochure that people can pick up. We also have uh, seed packets, native plant seed packets, and um, bookmarks that you're seeing on the left of your screen. Uh, we also have some coloring pages for kids and some new entrance signage that's a bit more informative for our visitors. Um, we are continuing to support native pollinator and wildlife species through our ecological practices. So we, our entire uh, green space is full of just native planting specifically to support our native wildlife and we also undertake a fair amount of ecological restoration to be able to continue to provide a healthy and thriving habitat specifically for native wildlife and also of course native New Yorkers. Um, we've seen just really lovely safe and physically distanced use of the space throughout the kind of pandemic months. Um, so that's in person at the NCL itself. And we've also throughout 2020, we were able to offer some virtual programming. So we had um, story time presented virtually. We also had sound baths and a beehive exploration. There's beehives on site at the NCL. Um, we're seeing a lot of regular visitors from the neighborhood, which we really love. So a lot of people that are returning and kind of um, taking in the space as it kind of goes through the seasons, as you're seeing on your screen. Um, we also are kind of continuing the work of um, supporting native wildlife. So we planted uh, about 1,500 new native wild or native plant species this fall. And so we're excited to see all of that come to fruition um, throughout next year. And frankly, hopefully even this year, we'll see some of that. Um, and a few kind of things that we would like to share that we're proud of is that we were designated a Monarch Way Station this year. And we also won an honor award for design from the American Society of Landscape Architects. So that's something that we're happy to share and um, glad that, again, we're supporting kind of our local community and um, that we're being recognized for that work. So I'm um, looking forward to the upcoming year. Um, again, kind of continued maintenance and operations on site at the NCL, a fair amount of ecological restoration. So we're located along 
the bikiwi, which often means that um, invasive species kind of have easy access to our site. And so that's a lot of the work that we do, um, invasive species removal on site and also along Williamsburg Street West. We also uh, work on trash removal along Williamsburg Street West and kind of general maintenance as much as we can. Um, a few things that you're seeing on your screen. So um, we're hoping that we'll be able to repair the sidewalk out in front of the NCL just to be able to increase access. Um, so you're seeing a few snapshots of uh, different segments along Williamsburg Street West directly in front of the NCL. And so we're hoping to repair the sidewalk again for accessibility reasons more than anything else and also to um, establish a few curb cuts to make the uh, sidewalk and also to make the Naval Cemetery landscape a safer and easily accessible space for the bicyclists that are coming down the Greenway. Um, at this present moment, there's no kind of easy access point. People kind of have to come to a screeching halt and like haul their bikes onto the sidewalk, which we've heard from a fair amount of visitors doesn't feel safe. People are kind of biking past them. Um, we've submitted a participatory budgeting proposal specifically for this project. So we just wanted to make this group aware of that. Um, and the last thing that I'll share is that we are also working on expanding our visitor hours. So we are open in a little bit more of a consistent way this winter on Saturdays and Sundays, 10 to 5 p.m. And we're also aiming to open five days a week, a little bit earlier than we have in the past this spring. So uh, mid-April, we'll be opening back up five days a week, Wednesday through Sunday, uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And again, hoping to see some of you there. Thank you so much, both of you, Anna and Terry, for that presentation. Before I ask um, my colleagues on the committee for questions, I wanted to, you, you referred a couple of times to native wild, wildlife. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a sense of what that includes? Yeah, absolutely. So um, native pollinator species, so bees, uh, wasps, butterflies. Um, I mentioned the monarchs. I could also mention uh, we've got carpenter bees, we've got um, native ground nesting bees. Um, we also have honey bees on site. Um, lots of different kinds of butterflies, swallowtails. Um, and we also have a very healthy um, bird population. Mm -hmm. And we actually, we have a survey happening right now um, with a bird specialist. So she comes by about once a month to do her survey and we heard recently, I want to say in late October, early November, that she was seeing birds that are very specific to a um, meadow um, environment or a meadow mm -hmm. habitat. And that is kind of what our site entails. It's a meadow habitat. And these birds are very picky. They don't appear unless they really do have the resources that they need to survive and to thrive. And so we were really happy to hear that. That's terrific. Thank you. I saw, mm -hmm. I happened to see four robins hanging out together on the sidewalk in Brooklyn Heights the other day. I was very surprised by that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, all right, I'm, uh, again, thank you. Uh, uh, committee members of the Parks Committee, questions? I can't see everybody. Barbara? Oh. Not yeah. a question, but I wanted uh, to call to our park committee members. When we go back to that screen, that was the last screen on the screen. If we could bring that back up again. That last screen you were sharing with us. Um, I the share. Oh, there we go. Hold on one second, and I'll bring it back. Yeah. This is not not something to do with uh, with the cemetery and the, it's the greenway. But I wanted our committees to see, you see that uh, tree standing in front of the, the left bottom, the tree pick there? That's the kind of a tree pick that's more common now versus the tree pit in the previous slide where you see the tree actually uprooting the sidewalk. 
And that's the that's the curse that we have sometimes in our neighborhood, is that the smaller tree pits uh, are being are the tree roots are forcing up the sidewalks, which is a hindrance to a lot of work in our on our sidewalk. It's the previous mm -hmm. slide. I'll note um, for for you and the rest of the committee that the the photograph on the bottom left that you're referring to is actually it's not on Williamsburg Street West as you know that's in um, in Red Hook I believe Anna correct um, versus the upper the upper left is of course on Williamsburg Street West um, and is uprooting the sidewalk as you're pointing out. It's not that I have a problem. I just wanted us to see that lower left tree pit, but that's the kind of a tree pit that is more desirable to have with our trees that are coming up on our sidewalks now. If you go to the previous slide, we you had, uh, yeah, take a look at the tree, this the top, the one on the left. You see how that smaller tree pit and what that does with the sidewalk, it uh, forces it up. Yeah. And that's it's also top. a big tree. Well, it's a big tree, but you know. They're gonna grow. But the trees grow, and that's what they exactly do. But they do not have a sufficient tree pit. And that's the kind of a thing that we in the committee and whoever joins the committee should be uh, having in their mind as they're, re they're replacing trees in our neighborhood. It has nothing to do with it. It's just that I saw the picture. Okay. Th thank you, Andrew. Um, if we can take those um, slides down so that I can see if anyone else has a question on the committee. Any questions from committee? Oh, yeah, Suzanne, yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the presentation. I live in Dumbo with my um, family. I have uh, teenagers. Um, I actually knew next to nothing about the Brooklyn Greenway Initiative and actually um, nothing about the Naval Cemetery landscape. So I appreciate um, you sharing um, that with us. Um, um, related to that, what is the what's the signage for the Greenway? Like um, in general, uh, what is the signage that's in place and uh, goals and things like that to, to help people understand what's there and how extensive it is? And and I'm thinking, you know, we get on bikes, but we're not bikers um, to make folks like us comfortable uh, with the idea of uh, biking in this city on the Greenway. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, there's, uh, I have two quick answers um, and I can follow up if you want more detail. Um, the signage that is put up are these round medallions that are from uh, DOT, Department of Transportation, that identify greenways throughout all five boroughs. And then there's a, like a, a line on them that says Brooklyn Waterfront so that you know you're on the Brooklyn Waterfront Greenway as opposed to, you know, the Jamaica Bay Greenway or what have you. Um, and they're placed sporadically among all kinds of other signage in our city. As you can imagine, unfortunately, some people miss them. Um, beyond that, some of the other signage that BGI has put up in the last year are COVID, COVID related signs. It was really about, you know, establishing more of a presence and uh, an awareness around uh, physically distancing yourself from other Greenway users, wearing a mask, things of that nature. Um, you know, and then and then there's other signage that's needed um, akin to, um, you know, Link NYC or other, you know, you are here types of pedestrian signs that the city uses that are more interpretive, educational, wayfinding, um, you know, that help people, to your point earlier, kind of know where they are and know where they can go. Um, you know, they may, you may not know what destinations exist. So those kinds of resources will help, uh, not only identify where you can go, but how to get there. Um, there's a, there's a lot that can be done on signage is the short answer. Thank you. And I think it's great that you also, um, you have the project going through participatory budgeting. Um, good luck with that. And thanks for highlighting that. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe the next year signage. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? Uh, at this point, I would ask if there are any questions from um, community board members beyond the committee. Uh, yes. Do you hear me, Barbara? Yes, I can. 
Yes, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, it, it's wonderful to see that this project has progressed so far because I was a uh, part of the original development of the planning for all of this, and we thought it was a pretty amazing initiative. So it's it's good to see that it's gotten this far. Um, Mr. Perrier, is he still with the organization? That's the first question. My second question is you gave us a number of percentages decrease and increase in terms of the uh, uh, utilization of the Greenway, but there was no baseline number from which to calculate what it actually means in terms of uh, usage. Uh, I also wanted to ask if there's any plan to install any type of cameras along the Greenway for safety or other purposes down the line. That's always uh, an issue for Community Board too. And um, the funding issue was already addressed. Yes, those are my questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. I can address the third one first, um, that any safety cameras or anything like that is you know, is the work of the city, and that's not something a BGI would do. Um, you know, we're happy to be part of the conversation, but that's not a decision that we we can make um, in terms of that kind of public infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Perrier, Milton Perrier, one of the co-founders of BGI, uh, retired in 2017. He is no longer with the organization, and actually all three co-founders over the last five years at this point have retired um, in sequence. So um, I've been the executive director for just about two and a half years. I'm thrilled and privileged to be so um, and happy to be with you here today, kind of building on the incredible legacy and success of the, previous, of the co founders. Um, and then your second question was about baseline use. Um, this year, our sensor in 2020 measured about 1.3 million people just on that segment of Williamsburg Street West. Um, and the I don't have the number in front of me of what it was in 2019, but somewhere around a million. Uh, sorry, less than that. Um, um, I would have to go back to the slide, but a few hundred thousand people. Um, we can follow up with the community board on those figures if you if you like. Thank you for your questions. And any Thank other you. questions uh, from community board members? Okay, we, we have a few more minutes. If anyone um, else uh, on the uh, meeting wants to ask a question. All right, hearing uh, no response, I'm going to again thank uh, Terry and um, and I, Anna and appreciate your um, your presentation and for just about staying within the time frame. So thank you. Uh, we're going on now to our second presentation, which has to do with a bathroom in a playground uh, in Fort Greene Park, and I noticed Dave Parker is at, at the meeting, so I appreciate, Dave, your being here. And Renee Collymore is going to um, speak about the bathroom proposal. Yes. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank, thank you. Can you can you hear me at least? Uh, yes, I'm absolutely. To, to okay, wonderful. All right. Well, I'm so sorry that I can't, get, I'm trying to get this video up, but I would like to say thank you to Community Board 2, uh, Parks Committee, and to all who are attending on tonight. Uh, I'm here because there's an issue on the north side of the park, on Myrtle Avenue side, where many of the people who have lived here for decades and decades have utilized um, that side of the park. Uh, the majority of the people that use that side of the park are the people from public housing across the street in Fort Greene, and not just them, but their family members, friends, and neighbors from the area. All of my life, I'm born and raised here, and I've never seen, honestly, I've never seen that bathroom uh, be presented in a respectable way. I've never seen the bathroom uh, look as if it provides dignity 
to the people of that area. It's unlike the bathroom at the top of the hill, the bathroom at the top of the hill, which is located inside of the tourist center, a much better looking bathroom. This issue reminds me of the 50s and the 60s where it was a, a uh, black water fountain and a white water fountain, a black bathroom and a white bathroom. We need fairness. I had a, 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 a rally for fairness, a fair treatment this summer concerning this bathroom. So my question is to you, uh, committee, have anyone and have any of you utilized this bathroom? And do you utilize it on a normal basis when you're in Fort Greene Park? We have many people there who use the bathroom or, or, or who want to use the bathroom and who do not use the bathroom because of the presentation, because of the unsafety, because of its being uncleanliness, and they will go back across the street to go into the uh, housing development to use the restrooms. We have a large senior citizen population there and they cannot use, use the restroom, nor is it uh, possible for them to go up those Rocky type, that is like the movie Rocky, go up the Rocky stairs to use the bathroom at the top of the hill. I'm making this presentation tonight because, not because of me, but because of the requests of the people who live in the neighborhood. I remember sitting in meetings and you guys are talking about a redesigning. And the people told me, Ms. Collin, was not about a redesigning. We, we don't need that. It, it, that's not what is needed. What we would like to have and what we would like to see and what we would appreciate more would be a good bathroom. I've heard this on several occasions. There are videos of people saying that to the Conservancy, which is the Fort Worth Conservancy, people representing the community board. We, there was a meeting in the well, Whitman Library oh, last year sometime. Uh, there was there's a group in Fort Green area that has the video because they were the ones that made the video. I sat there and I watched it. Mr. I believe Mr. Barker was there. I don't know. But there were people from the neighborhood and who heard and saw the same things that I heard and that I saw. Why are we ignoring the requests of the people? And even if you say, Ms. Collingwood, but it's too expensive. They told me through an email by someone named Mr. Bill Johnson, I think is his name, sent me an email and told me before I, 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 I embarrassed myself further. And he told me that the bathroom was going to cost nearly $5 million. That's the cost of a brownstone home. Are you telling me to uh, excuse me? Bathroom? Excuse me, Renee. Um, I, I appreciate everything you're saying. Um, I'm, I thought you were here with some sort of proposal. Now, is yes. your proposal that I'm not clear from what you're saying? Do you want the bathroom clean better than it is, or do you want the bathroom um, redesigned? It didn't sound like well, you wanted it. Are you talking think... about upkeep and maintenance? No, no, no. I'm getting to that. I'm making my introduction, just just like a, just like everyone else, and I'm making this point because of the importance of why I'm going to ask. For what I'm asking for, um, because of what the community was saying, it's not about cl just cleaning the bathroom. We are asking for a renovated bathroom, and we have uh, pictures to show some examples of something that would be great for this neighborhood. What we are proposing would be almost like art installation. What we are proposing would be something where it would attract just not us, but we are a uh, a tourist city, and we want to have something that we can be proud of to say that we're taking care of not just um, people coming out from out out of the country, but the people who live here. So this is why I have Ramona Albert on with me and others because we have done some research and Tokyo Japan has led the way and the charge on this uh, type of new style modern day bathroom public restrooms. 
and I think that we can utilize this here. And but I was telling you the, the, the back story because of how I was told that this would cost nearly almost $5 million and we can save money and help the city save money by getting a new installation uh, of a bathroom in Fort Greene Park. You gave us 10 minutes, I thought uh, you said. So Ramona, can Ramona show you some examples of things that we have seen and some things that we have researched that could be something that we could consider? Because listen, I'm not a newcomer. I've sat in a thousand com uh, 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 community board meetings where you had installation of artwork of a whole arm and a finger and <laughs> we want something that can help someone. And this bathroom, a modern day bathroom that will bring dignity and fairness and just doing what's right. Uh, and we have an obligation to do and, 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 and uh, do right by the people who live in the community. That's why I'm here, because we have an obligation. And by giving us a new renovated bathroom would be this obligation being fulfilled, because for decades, all of my life, this, this obligation has not been fulfilled by way of this bathroom. Ramona? Okay, so so I am uh, I'm here to support Renee. Renee and I are neighbors. We live in Fort Greene as well, and um, I'm a friend of hers. So so I will just present some images, and these are ideas. By no means these are final solutions for this, right? And so um, we have discussed uh, our ideas for the bathroom, especially Renee's kind of vision for what this is, and I will be sharing just some images to um to give you some insight into what we're um what we're talking about just give me one second okay can you see my screen yes we can okay so yeah. just to give you a little bit of a background on what what renee wanted um uh to start with, these are actually some of the, it's a, it's a very similar situation. It, they're designed in Japan um, and it was a, uh, there, are several, there are public bathrooms that are put um, in, a, in a park. And what's so interesting about these is that they use a special smart glass that when they're, when they're not used, the glass is uh, open when, and when they're being used, the glass is opaque, right? Um, so this is one of the, the kind of initiating, initiating ideas that Renee started with, and she wanted to propose something very similar to this. So on the basis of it, um, and this is another image of the, of the Japanese bathroom in a very similar situation as it is in, in Fort Green Park next to a playground to kind of enhance the condition itself. Um, I also wanted to kind of talk about some similar conditions in, in for example, in San Francisco, where they're, they're using um, these very kind of high-tech stainless steel bathrooms where they're reusing the rainwater um, to flush the toilets. They're integrated in the, in the, in the city by um, having the screens on their skins. And so they're essentially quite, uh, quite, um, you know, self-sustaining, but also they're, uh, they they act on their own. This is another image. So this is an this is a, an image of what we were studying, um, an image of what we're thinking about this 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 bathroom of being without um, with the glass open, um, with a green roof on top of it, and having uh, again. Um, stainless steel interior and it would it would look like something like this during the day using a reflective uh, coating on the glass um, uh, or uh, totally transparent so these are some of the ideas this is another image of what it looks like when it's um, not used and then another image of what it would look like when it's used so these are just generating ideas so by by no means take them as final solutions but but these are some of the the things that we're thinking about as as we're discussing the ideas of the playground so that's pretty much what i have i'm going to stop sharing the screen thank you uh anything else um that you wanted to say, Renee, about this bathroom? I also uh, thought from what you had said, you have pictures of how the bathroom looks now. Do you have any of yeah, those? Yeah, there is a video. Uh, Ramona, do you have that video? There is a video that... I can have... 
I can show the video actually. How that, long is the video? It's very short. I can show you a, a shot from the video. Let me share my That'd screen. That'd be perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Because I, I pulled it up just because I figured you would ask. Yeah. Just one Thank second. You. Thank you, Ramon. So here, this is this is it. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. So it's actually, this is itself and there's a playground behind it. Um, if I go, you know, this is another condition. See, this is an interior shot of it. I mean, it's it's very dilapidated, right? It's you get the it's it's horrible. But the bathroom itself looks like this right now. So what Renee is is, is proposing is to take this down and actually create a, somehow of an art installation in place of it that can be more active um, for the children as well for everything else in the in the area. So that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Renee, did you have something else you wanted to add? Ramon, is anyone else on with us that yes, we spoke um, with earlier? Uh, Barbara, can you hear me? Can you hear uh, me, Barbara? Ernest, is that you? Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it oh, is. yes, we have another person online um, with us to support our efforts. Yeah, um, Mr. Augustus. I came to uh, voice my support for this effort. Uh, I thank Renee for bringing this to my attention. I've lived in Fort Greene uh, my entire life. Uh, I've, as you know, I've been active on the Land Use and Landmark Preservation Committee and on the Transportation Committee. I haven't devoted that much time to parks. This is actually sort of my first or well, second parks visit, but I was um, somewhat taken aback. When Can I, I ask you to step back from your microphone a little bit? I think we might hear, understand you better. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was Thanks. taken aback when I did a site visit at this location. And, uh, you know, uh, Renee uh, got an unsolicited uh, email, and I was taken back by that email that was from a Ted Johnson, who I learned later was part of the Fort Greene Park Conservancy. And what he said, I found offensive to the fact that he basically to quote, before you embarrass yourself further regarding the lack of money uh, allocated to the north side of Fort Greene Park, people have been successful uh, in raising funds for the north side and uh, with explicit mandate from BP Adams of addressing a common goal of park, park equity. Um, we're all users of the park receive equal attention and funding. Uh, but he was dismissive of this uh, capital project uh, because he's uh, working on about getting the funding from um, parks without borders, whose basically design is to um, redesign the park, but not in a manner that would be uh, helpful to the residents. Uh, let me, uh, but I said to Renee, I, and I like Ramona's design, but the responsibility for this park is actually lies with the park department uh, in terms of uh, you know putting this in their budget and to develop a um, a bathroom that services these residents. Uh, so I don't want to belabor this point, but I think this is an item that the park committee uh, could uh, recommend for a capital budget uh, for CB2 and to really lobby for it. But it's, it's about time. There have been so much disinvestment of, in this community for parks to service the residents. And I think the time is now uh, to uh, discard all the arguments about why a capital project cannot be done now in Fort Green Park by the Parks Department. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else? Yes. Well, before we get to our committee, is, yes. is, uh, Renee, was there some? Are you speaking on behalf of Renee's proposal, or are you speaking as a parks member? As a parks committee member. Member, yeah. This is Carolyn. Right, Carolyn. So let me let me just see if Renee is finished before we okay. We go, okay? And then we'll go to you first, Renee. Did you want to say something else? Um. I believe I'm, 
I am through because I think my presentation my, or what I said was clear, but I want to make sure that I want everyone to understand that this again for what I am saying is about the community having fairness and having a bathroom that's presentable. As a community board, you represent the people of the community and the community in this area are asking for a respectable bathroom. I have to champion this because of the need. And there's an obvious need, as you can see. And this is not something that is impossible to do. Um, this is something that I see that you guys do all the time when we get ready to vote on all so, so many different things. Remember, I was elected before, so I understand what it is that when people get ready to vote on something that they want, they vote and they get it done. But we have to think about the reasoning and we have to think about the reason why we need this bathroom for the people. They have complained. And if you watch the video in its entirety, it talks about the homeless population that goes into the bathroom to take showers. There are drugs. There's no monitoring. There's no uh, um, cameras. There's nobody to watch out. And so something like this could bring not just a, a wow factor for the community, but it'll bring something new, something inspiring, and something that can be uh, something that the people can say, wow, government really does work for us, and they really do care. So I have to champion this, and I'm asking if you guys can give this consideration to support this measure to go to the full board for a yes vote. Thank you. Um I'm going to respond to that in a minute, but I know Carolyn is waiting, so I'm going to let Carolyn um, speak or ask her question. Uh, yes, I just wanted, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I, I agree totally with what Ms. Collimore is saying, but I want to remind us that we went through this like five or six years ago. We were talking about having public toilets in various areas of the city and how we were told it was too expensive, things didn't work, whatnot. So how is that going to be different now? Is Can I answer that? Sure. Well it's, well, it's going to be different because we have some costs. And the costs for international materials are much different than they are here. Ramona and I, Ramona, <laughs> we're going to have to talk about these uh, cheap costs so that we can uh, uh, let them understand that we can do this. They, you know, as you guys are aware, the city is already gone bankrupt. So we have to do mm -hmm. everything in our power to be able to bring the type of glass and materials that we can use uh, that it's not going to cost us a fortune. Um, you know, the sustainable solution also, which uh, we have with the plants and the greenery on the top of the bathroom, that's another way to help uh, reduce costs and, 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 and clean our air and, and things of this nature to help with this project. Now, um, Ramona? Yeah. Hello, Ramona. Well, yeah, I'm just I'm trying to, to think about this because I, I'm not sure. Um, on on one hand, we have priced the project out initially. Um, I hesitate to discuss direct costs because I'm not sure what the budgets are of the city, and so these are different. You know, I'm not sure what you're. I'm, I'm just the designer, so I'm not someone to discuss costs in this. But case. yes, what I what I'm okay. Let me pull up my email. We went through this. We went through this as a community board back uh, like five or six years ago when we were trying to get public toilets right. in City Hall Park. We were trying to get them in other areas of the city. And what we were told was the expense was so much. And it's not that I'm against what you want. I, I want right, to- Right, 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 no, I understand. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, how are we gonna get this through? They're telling us even to, what was it, Barbara, last year when we were talking about um, Commodore Barry, and they were saying it cost $2, $2 million to do a, a 
I think it was more than that. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I, I don't remember offhand the cost of redoing the bathroom at Cadman Plaza, but uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, so any of them, any of the bathrooms, whenever we talked about trying to redevelop them, because we need to do that. Right. Uh, they were telling us it costs two or three million dollars to do a bathroom. Oh. Right. So I can answer that question um, without actually giving you specifics. I can tell you it's, we priced this out and the cost was way, 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 way less than that. And, and so what we're trying to, to, to do here is to create a solution that is not costly. Right. And so so one of the ideas was, you know, when Rene was asking, well, I really like this idea of the glass that switches. And of course, I do it, too. But but there's uh, there's similar solutions. And that's why I showed the image with the reflective glass, you know, kind of does a similar has a, creates a similar okay. look, okay, which is cheaper. Right. So so the cost that we've gotten before we even started thinking is we're, we're way not even to the level of like you know, 500,000. So, so these are things that, you know, that I, obviously we don't want to lock ourselves into to a specific cause because we're not, you know, the ones that are giving the money, but it's, it's a matter of, of, you know, having this like thought about these ideas of cost before. So, so yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. And we did think about this before and I think you're right. Yeah, but five minutes, that's a lot of money. For, so these are small pieces. They're, they're small, you know. Uh, could I say something, Robert? Uh, who, who, is that Andrew? No. Um, oh, so, or ne Mr. Augustus, yes. Yeah. You, know, the, you know, there are certain functions that, are, that the government has to, has to perform as a government. You know, you have, you know there's a reason that you have talked uh, as, as public spaces. And I have a concern about this whole effort. I mean, we have all these park conservancies. Uh, they don't bring that issue the Central Park or the Highline Park or the uh, Bryant Park, uh, you know, because uh, they're in other neighborhoods, you know. But there are certain things where we got to stop disinvesting, especially in Black community. I heard this for 40 years, you know, this constant disinvestment. If they want to find money, they can find money. You know, that's like saying, let's not invest in public education because we don't have the money. We do it. And we do it in terms of parks. Parks are very essential, you know, in terms of just the society, in terms of democracy, in terms of people coming together. Public space is important for the uh, for harmony, for you know, for the harmony in this city, and you've got to look at it from a public policy, public space initiative. Forget about the money. It was, it was the money will never have any parks. But there's a theory behind public parks. There's a policy behind that, you know, and that's the argument you have to make. Thank you. Is is there anyone else on the committee who has a question? Uh, may I say something? I'm sorry. This is Renee Collymore. Okay, I want to try to move on, but if you can do it quickly, I want to give I people I yes, I can. opportunities design to ask questions. Design the engineering, $40,000. Installation, $50,000. Glass and aluminum frame cost, if we're using smart glass, $220,000. Glass and aluminum frame cost, if we're using reflective glass, painted in black for um, OPEC uh, costs can go down about 120,000. Additional considerations connecting to the existing sewer, new toilet sinks. All right, the smart glass can deteriorate over time, so I would suggest reflective option, which has more interesting solutions. These are low cost items. Okay, Mr. Smith? Can you unmute, Dwight? Okay, here we go. Finally. Thank you. Uh, um, I, um, uh, I, I just say, to Mr. Augustus, that um, you are uh, expressing the frustration that 
we committee members have had over the years. Uh, it is about money. In the end, the best we've been able to do is to get back uh, into um, the capital budgets that then never get funded because of the funding mechanism that we have for part is at the uh, it is a function of the largesse of the council member and to some degree you know city hall but there's no capital improvement program that goes uh playground by playground facilities by facilities so um we i propose that for for as a starter we get this bathroom into our capital but our capital projects needs list but with the with the recognition that it is going to take a while and notwithstanding the low costs that uh, projections that i've heard are something called city standards that we, if we can actually get a bathroom that's brick and mortar, I'd be happy with that. I'd love to have something fancy. I think, you know, um, what, to the extent that the parks department uh, architects think of uh, <clears throat> creatively, it's certainly something worth looking at. Uh, but in the, in, in the end, if we can, in the first instance, get it on our capital projects, uh, pro capital needs list, that's the best we can do for starters in what everybody understands is a um, scarce capital environment. Uh, we're not yet bankrupt, but we do have capital constraints, um, uh, money constraints. Uh, but getting it on the list is good for starters. But, you know, it's, it could take five, six years. That's what's happened with, you know, bathrooms that we've, we've had as top of, uh, top of our uh, needs list of uh, uh, priorities. So, uh, right. thank you, uh, Miss Quinn. Yeah, I was I, going to. I was going to say something similar as well. To me, it's not up to us to really concern ourselves with with the costs, although we all think that they're uh, you know uh, very high. Um, but to concern ourselves with the cost or the solution or even the design um, at this juncture and with any project, we expect that there would be some kind of community visioning that would, would provide input into the design of every project, of every approved project. I agree with Dwight. Um, thank you for raising this at the meeting and raising it to our attention um, because that helps us to prepare the best um, statement of district needs um, for this committee. Um, and I think um, that's where the conversation um, starts. Um, so personally, I'll commit to um, going over to Fort Green Park and checking it out myself um, and talking to some folks. Oh, I support that. Thank you. Is, is there anyone else on the Parks Committee who wants to ask a question at this point? I just asked, but I wanted to add. Uh, Andrew? I, from our end of the Parks Committee, I think we have already three projects of bathrooms in our district that are in the works or hoping for further financing. The latest one is at the Commodore Barry Park. We reiterated that we want that completed. We have a wish list or, or something that's in in the project already working, and that's the bathroom at the uh, uh, Walt Cabinet Plaza. Cabinet Plaza. That's in the works. We also have a request and a desire to have a bathroom at the, the Bridge Park too. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Washington Hall, maybe, too. Uh, and, and I will mention, uh, we're going to be talking about Willoughby Square shortly, that any time um, Willoughby Square came up before, there was a, a the issue of a bathroom at that site was very much discussed. So bathrooms are a big issue for everybody. Yes, we recognize that, and we do want it to be equitable. We really now have at least three projects pertaining to bathrooms in our district in parks. So it's not like we don't want it. We reiterate it. We put it on right. again. But it's an issue of council money into the budget, the borough president, mm -hmm. and city hall. We don't have the funds ourselves. It goes in from us into a wish list, and then it's funded by whoever is the people that control the purse. 
And usually they come to us with a design and ask us to, for our opinion on the design. We don't usually recommend to right. the parks department that they should, uh, you know, except through the budget process um, that here is a bath, you know, here's some place that needs a new bathroom. I, I would, would suggest there. Um, well, at any rate, um, Mr. Smith, yes. Yeah, I, I'd just like to make uh, another point. Um, can we talk about what can be done today? And we've got David Baker on the line. Uh, what I heard Ms. Collymore say is that the bathroom uh, is dirty, not well maintained, and, but more importantly, it's used by, you know, by the homeless folks and, you know, as they're changing stations. So the question is, what can be done today uh, to help with at least the maintenance side of, uh, of the issue? Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I understand very clearly that folks have, you know, real reluctance to going into dirty bathrooms anywhere. And certainly then to have to deal, you know, with excessively dirty because you've got folks who have no other place to, uh, uh, to deal with their cleanliness habits. I mean, that just exacerbates the problem. So uh, to David, is there a way to improve, you know, I mean, uh, given all these, uh, you know, uh, uh, the cleanliness there, the, the, the maintenance schedule, shall we say? Uh, thanks, Dwight. And hi, I'm Dave Barker, the uh, director of Fort Green Park. So responsible for keeping the park clean, green, and safe with a uh, you know a talented group of uh, of park employees, as well as you know working with a lot of volunteers uh, on projects. The uh, the bathrooms and the playground, as well as the visitor center at the monument, are are cleaned twice a day, if not more, uh, depending on conditions that arise. Um, I have a worker who often goes out of his own way, you know, out of, out of pocket to buy, you know, fragrant, fragrant things like fabulosa to spruce, to spruce it up uh, as needed. Um, we have talked about uh, doing a uh, power washing uh, this winter, um, kind of a deeper clean in both uh, the visitor center and the and the playground bathrooms, as well as uh, some touch up painting, which which will help. Um, but they are both bathrooms are clean twice a day. The, the, the benefit, the extra in the playground bathroom, uh, when staffing allows, and obviously we are in a, a tough fiscal environment right now, but, um, right now, actually, we do have a, what we call a fixed post employee, uh, who, who is dedicated to the playground and the bathroom. Uh, we don't have that up at the visitor center. Um, so when staffing allows, we have a fixed post knowing that that the playground is is always busy and that the there's a high demand for those bathrooms um you know the bathroom is open to everyone you know whether you have a roof over your head at night or whether you don't um we do have parks enforcement who check on the bathroom um throughout the day um and um uh, you know alert me alert the maintenance crews to any conditions um but uh you know our standard is twice a day and and we often go beyond that, um, especially in the summer when the when the when the when the bathrooms can be open until 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. Um, and and they 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 would need more than twice a day. But the kind of the minimum is is twice a day, and we're looking forward to um, you know doing a deeper clean this winter. And um, thank you to uh, to Ms. Collimore and and her colleague for bringing the uh, proposal uh, you know to this meeting. And the Parks Department hasn't had a chance to review uh, the. Uh, installations that from from Japan or, or from other cities, but we would certainly well, you know, we would want to discuss it and be we we just can't comment until we have kind of a proposal that would show a little more detail about the you know the the specifications and the cost. Um, and I you know I certainly love taking photos and getting inspiration from other cities when I'm on my on my travels, whether it's you know a trash can or a, a sign, um, and so. You know, I thank you for bringing bringing those images to this meeting, and um, you know, I think the next step would just be to kind of share some more detail um, with the borough commissioner uh, Marty Marr and uh, and his chief of staff Davey Eyes, um, you know, with a little more detail on on those installations um, that you shared at the meeting. 
Mr. Uh, Barker, thank hello, you so I much for that. Okay. Um, we didn't need to put you on the spot, but we really appreciate your comments and your input. So thank you and all the work you do for the park. Thank you, Mr. Barker. Thank May you. I say something, please? Did, well, did you guys get the video that was sent to you just now? I, I, we don't have a, I don't know. Uh, Taya, do we have a video? Ramona, where did you send the, 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 the video to? No, Ramona, you have to send it to them, not me. Uh, can, uh, we, can we send you the video? Because the video is telling. I oh, can no. say that... The, the I, I would like us shows the state of the video. Right. Well, we did see the photos. We did see the photos. I, I think what you can do is send the video. The All right. If we have time, I want to make sure we have time for our next presenter. So if we have time, we will show it. We did see the pictures. Um, it's been my experience that the Parks Department does not tear down bathrooms. They might renovate them. Um, I think that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, what I want to do now is um, open this to board members, and I have a statement here from a board member who could not attend tonight. And I've been asked to read it. I just want to remind you, this is not my statement. This is a statement from Alejandro Varela, and I'm mm -hmm. just reading this so that people can hear it. And I don't know if we want to put it in the chat as well, but um, he said... The language of the Fort Greene Park bathroom proposal. Now, he's actually seen, I guess, a written proposal, which we don't have before us this evening, is a bit harsh and somewhat uncaring. As a parent of two children who frequent the north side playground of Fort Greene Park, I hope the plan includes resources for the allegedly homeless population that is being described here. I have many times had to hold my nose in order to take my kids to a playground bathroom. But I also understand that there are a lack of resources for undomiciled people. Ultimately, I can take my kids home to use the bathroom. What options do homeless people have? I would like for the bathrooms to be clean, well kept, and available. But I pray this grassroots proposal can take a multi layered approach that meets multiple needs at once. Thank you for addressing this issue. Uh, now, are there any other board members who want to make a comment? Yes, Barbara. This is John Dew. Oh, Mr. Dew, yes. Yes. Um, I did. I meant or ask a question. I, I contact your uh, committee a couple of months ago to add the Green Park to the list of projects. I'm sorry, to add which park? This bathroom we're talking about. Okay. Uh, it should have been added to our, and we also have this lawsuit for the uh, Fort Green Park that has prevented the renovations from taking place. Is it possible in the interim that we could ask the Parks Department with maybe some discretionary funding from the council member, if that's required, to do some upgrades temporarily to that bathroom before we have to go through a full renovation. It is certainly possible to do something that doesn't amount to the cost of a full renovation in the interim years until we can get the full renovation funded. Okay. And if, if Ms. Collymore can send whatever she has proposed and all that investigatory work to the Parks Department, this is going to go through the Parks Department, and the Community Board really has no uh, 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 part in the design phase. Right. So while all good for an educational purpose and to let us know what is out there, that's really not what the Community Board does. We have to send it to the Parks Department. They have to go through it and make whatever decisions they want, and we can certainly recommend that they take a look at it. We can't actually expect they're going to adopt any of the things that were presented because they have their own structure within which all of these capital projects have to go through. Thank you, Mr. Do. Now, just let me ask you, is there anyone else from the board who has a question? 
Anyone from the community who has a question? All right, so Miss um, Collymore, how long is your video? Uh, Ramona, uh, it's about two minutes. All right, I want to proceed and let us finish, get our, our work done, and then if we, we'll show it at the end. Um, but I want to, um, I want to let all our presenters and, and get finished with all the business because we did see the pictures of the inside of the um, of of the bathroom. So thank you very much for bring, awareness is always half of the battle. So those of us who are not familiar with this bathroom or the state of it, you certainly have brought this to our attention, and I feel that's always very important to do. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for listening. Right. And now I want thank to turn you. it over to uh, Ricky DaCosta, who is going to um, tell us about a, I think, some revisions in the Willoughby Square Open Space Project. We have heard very much about that project over time, several times, and I think there's a lot of interest um, both at this committee, at the Yucca Committee, and the Community Board in general about this um, park space, which is, I forget if it's a half an acre or an acre in size, and so we're very much interested in um, hearing what you have to say. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, uh, and thanks uh, to everybody. Um, so, uh, as you said, my name is Ricky DaCosta. I'm the Brooklyn Borough Director at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Uh, I'm joined by a number of colleagues uh, from my team, uh, in addition to some of our consultants uh, and some friends from the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, who you'll hear more from later. Uh, we're here tonight with the really, uh, I think, exciting progress update. I think last time we came to the board in summer of 2019, we were just getting started with the redesign. Um, of the open space at Willoughby Square. Uh, some of you may, may remember it previously included an underground garage and some other things that um, are not uh, part of the project anymore. This is just going to be open space. Uh, so our teams have been hard at work updating the design. Um, and uh, I think without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to my colleague Simon, who's going to talk you through where we are um, currently in the design process show you some updated uh, images and rendering of what this open space is going to look like. Yeah, thank you, Ricky, and um, thank you, everybody, uh, CB2, for, for giving us some time tonight. I'm just going to put it up on the screen. Uh, my name is Simon Betzalel. Um, I'm a project manager with EDC, and um, before we hand it off to Department of Cultural Affairs and the artist. I just want to give you a couple brief um, project updates uh, since we presented uh, preliminary design, I guess, in, as Ricky mentioned. Uh, just a few quick updates. Um, you know where the site is, or if you don't, downtown Brooklyn between Duffield Street, Willow Street, and LB Square West. A number of developments um, occurring in the area. Excuse me one second, Simon. Uh, I was just reminding everyone to mute yourselves, please. Um, you, it, it's not that easy to hear what you're saying, Simon. So I'm hopefully that if everyone mutes, we'll be able to hear you better. Thank you. Sure. Sorry about that. And I can, I'll speak up a little bit as well. Um, uh, so just a number of developments are occurring in the area, just really highlighting the importance of this public space. Just blow Bluetooth. What? Uh, so, just to briefly touch on the updates that have occurred since uh, the last time this was presented to you as a group. Um, we have an uh, inclusion of a small maintenance area uh, within the park for the folding chairs and tables that will be put in the seating area. Uh, we've widened this pathway between one Willoughby Square and the park to allow for vehicle access uh, and the maintenance of these light poles by DOT as well as a fence around the play area, the children's play area. Uh, and then in, uh, in an effort to coordinate our design with the overall um, Downtown Brooklyn Partnerships um, greening initiative, uh, we are including some planters along Alby Square West. Uh, so in, some updated renderings of the park uh, with those additions. 
planners are visible here along Albee Square West, as well as the fence enclosure. Um, and the main reason we're coming to speaking today is to discuss public art. Um, so this is a location map of where those might be, but um, just we'll pass this off to Sergio Pardo with Department of Cultural Affairs to um, take the rest of the way. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Sergio Pardo, the program manager of um, the Percent for our program of Cultural Affairs, um, and I would like to introduce Camila Jana Rashid, who is the artist selected for the In Pursuit of Freedom Percent for our project here at the Willoughby Square. All righty, give me one sec. I'm just going to share my screen. <clears throat> Is everyone able to see the screen? Yep. Alrighty. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and enter full screen. All right. Um, so good evening. Thanks everyone uh, for having me. And I uh, really appreciate getting to hear <clears throat> about a lot of the things that are happening uh, in CB2. Uh, my name is Camila Janan Rashid and I uh, am the artist that's selected to work on the public art for Willoughby Square. Uh, the quick arc of this presentation is that I'm going to share a little bit of my past work and then talk to you guys briefly about uh, plans for the work at Willoughby Square. Um, and then, as I imagine, we'll have a few moments uh, to discuss or uh, respond to questions. Uh, so in thinking about my practice, I work uh, extremely text-based. I work a lot with uh, thinking about how language lives in different spaces. Uh, this is from a project called Are We Reading Closely, which just came down at Brooklyn Museum uh, yesterday, actually, on the 10th. Uh, this was the first uh, time that an artist was uh, invited to use the columns outside of Brooklyn Museum uh, in order to display artwork. And in addition to this artwork, I did a series of public programming, thinking about aspects around uh, close reading uh, and political features. Uh, in addition to that work, um, I also created um, a large scale text banner at the Brooklyn Public Library back in 2019 for a solo project called Scoring the Stacks, which including uh, this banner also invited different uh, folks who were visiting the library to engage in a series of activities to go around the library, look for particular things, and then come into public programming in order to uh, create new things from the things that they were finding uh, through their exploration. Uh, this is a banner that was at the Venice Biennale in 2017, which reads, Are We There Yet? Um, this work is titled, Are We There Yet? And Other Questions of Proximity, Destination, and Relative Comfort. I'm a former high school teacher, and so a lot of my work really thinks about ways uh, to think things that are educative and pedagogical in public spaces. Um, and I sort of move between large questions um, and sort of opaque statements, um, sort of giving uh, something for people to engage with a lot over time. This is inside the Brooklyn Museum in 2018 for a group project, which invited artists to activate some of the uh, space in the Brooklyn Museum. Um, this work is still up at the Brooklyn Museum now, was reinstalled uh, recently. Um, and in addition uh, to uh, that work, um, again, I work in a lot of different spaces. This is from a project at Volta Art Fair back in 2018 that sort of thinks about uh, a public art piece, um, at least in the context of this fair, um, that invited folks to engage with the things that are on the wall. So thinking about artworks that are both uh, permanent uh, in their presentation, but also offerable by the public. Uh, this is from the summer. Uh, I was invited by Times Square Art and Four Freedoms. Uh, to create a message for um, essential workers who are out working. Uh, my husband is, in fact, an essential worker. Um, and so I thought about this as an opportunity uh, to speak to him, but also an opportunity to think about the folks who are out in the early mornings and late at night, keeping the city going while we're going through this um, crisis. And so I'm thinking about uh, all the work that I've done in the past, that's, that's sampling there. Uh, when thinking about the Willoughby Square um, opportunity and the history uh, around liberation and emancipation, I wanted to approach similar questions. Um, and so in thinking about this, this is our location. Um, and as uh, Simon already showed you, here are a few of the locations that I'm interested in uh, positioning some of the public um, artwork. 
uh, I'm particularly interested in the seating, uh, seating areas, um, as well as thinking about how the ground might be used, um, as well as some uh, freestanding structure that invites folks into the space as well. Uh, and thinking a lot about the choice in um, what sort of architecture or, or, or structures to intervene on in the park, I was thinking a lot about the roles of, of uh, porches, uh, particularly in Black culture, but um, in, in many uh, communities, the ways that porches are often uh, sort of function as a place of gathering, of storytelling, um, of, of respite, of just, just sort of uh, finding space in community. And so a lot of the work that I want to do is sort of thinking about how these resting areas, these seating areas um, can not only be just a place to sit, but also be a place where we can position questions and comments and texts uh, that may elicit conversation between folks who arrive at the park together or folks who happen to end up sitting um, next to each other at the park. And so because given the materials of the park, um, we're really invested in thinking about the use of engraving and carving directly into uh, the stone as an option and paying attention to that materiality. Um, but in just beyond the, the engraving, also making a focus on where the sort of typeface or text um, style comes from. So right now looking at a range of things, including uh, the Freeman's Torchlight and the Ram's Horn, which were both um, uh, Black newspapers and publications uh, in 19th century New York. Uh, Freeman's um, Torchlight being from Weeksville and the Ram's Horn was more uh, mo like larger New York. I'm thinking about how these typefaces may uh, impact the design of the text. There's also Black News, which is a uh, a newspaper uh, or a publication or newsletter that was published um, in the 60s and 70s in um, Brooklyn. And there were, um, there, this, is, this comes from the Brooklyn Public Library Archive, um, but sort of thinking about this vernacular handwriting as well um, as inspiration for the design of the lettering. And of course, all the beautiful signage in Brooklyn as well that might also be um, interesting to think about incorporating uh, elements of as well. Uh, but the main thing here is to think about how text shows up in places outside of books, um, outside of galleries, to think about the public space as a place where we can uh, engrave, include questions around emancipation, liberation, uh, and sort of the future um, of how we think about equity uh, directly into the park structure. Um, and with that being said, I just want to quickly uh, drop a note here around public programming. Uh, for my high school teacher, um, and as a person who's interested in working in community, uh, we originally had planned to work closely with the community uh, in person uh, to start thinking about the questions, thinking about uh, the language. And of course, we can't do that in person at this moment. So we've uh, thought through a series of pathways to uh, sort of compensate for that loss of in-person uh, interaction. Uh, the first uh, option or pathway that we're exploring is thinking about the use of cards, pre-posted uh, cards uh, that people could pick up at local public libraries um, that have questions or prompts on them that they can be mailed back, um, that we can use those as a moment of contemplation to help us develop the questions. I've done this several times in the past. I've done it at Rice University in um, Houston, Texas. I've also done it at Brooklyn Public Library uh, for a series of months, and both of those experiences were really fruitful. Um, let me show a few more images here. Uh, this is the table that was at Brooklyn Public Library. This was a heavily um, engaged with experience. We had a lot of people um, do this and we ran out of materials at one point and kept reprinting. Uh, this is also at the Lutnick uh, Library at Haverford College in Philadelphia. Similar experience of using uh, cards as prompts. It's a low entry point. Folks can pick up things, take them home, do them with family, mail them back for free um, and take their time. It's an asynchronous option a few more examples of uh, display possibilities. Uh, the other option is what we're doing here. Um, we're not necessarily on Zoom, uh, but using this uh, uh, web conferencing uh, platform uh, in order to communicate with people. So inviting people to a Zoom call or a WebEx call to engage in these conversations and using that as an opportunity to start conversations, reach out to people individually and think about uh, different uh, sort of uh, communities of stakeholders to engage with. Uh, another pathway is collaboration with public school teachers. Um, as I said, I'm a former high school teacher uh, and now work for a nonprofit doing curriculum development and teacher coaching. Uh, so I have connections to a lot of schools in New York City 
Um, and I know a lot of teachers. And so thinking about the possibilities of uh, engaging um, young people and thinking about these questions of emancipation through short lessons um, or some type of survey that students might be engaged with or any type of collaboration with teachers who might be interested in getting their students' voices involved in the production of this work. Um, and then finally, uh, this pathway, the Google Form, another asynchronous option for folks who may not be able to show up to Zoom or may not be able to get to um, a location to pick up pre-postage uh, prompt cards, having a Google Form that asks a series of targeted questions that may help us uh, sort of uh, make sense of collective imaginings or conversations around equity and emancipation. And the email correspondence, of course, for anyone who um, might just be interested in emailing. Um, that is all I have. I try to go as quickly as possible. Um, I'm really excited uh, to have been selected for this opportunity and I'm looking forward to working uh, with you all and working with the community and whatever permutations uh, the future <laughs> uh, allows uh, for, our, for our interaction. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's it for our presentation. Um, we are more than happy to take questions from anybody. Barbara. Barbara, are you ready for questions? Uh, one second. No, um, I, I was speaking, but I was muted. So I, I wanted to say a thank you to Ms. Rashid. I, I, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to meet you. And you seem like the perfect person to do this project. It, it, you're so thoughtful and directed and talented. And I'm wondering, are you thinking merely of words for this project? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Because they they can be so um, inspiring and informational and stay with you when you leave. So I, I think that's great. Um, so thank you for that. I had a question for your colleagues. Um, in one of the pictures we saw, it looked like the cars are on the same level as the as the Willoughby Square. Mm -hmm open space, which is not what I had envisioned. So it is, is this space at ground at street level? Simon, uh, I believe we're great, but Simon, do you want to go ahead and answer that? Yeah, um, no, in the rendering, there's a, a, a slight visual differentiation between the street and the curb, but no, it's standard um, streetscape, uh, street level curb, and then park is at sidewalk level. Oh, so the park is at sidewalk level. Yes. I didn't realize that. Okay. That I'm I'm glad I straightened that out. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you for this presentation. And it, it sounds like this is on the road now. Um, do you have a sense of when we might see be able to use this park? Very good question. So, um, you know, as of right now, we are just wrapping up the design and, and very happy that we were able to complete it. Um, you know, as everybody knows, the city's funding situation or capital budget situation is not uh, what it once was. So we still um, are kind of waiting for the green light um, to let us know that we'll be able to go ahead with construction. So, so I can't give you a date tonight, um, but we're hoping to move forward as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, so are there questions from the parks committee members? Ms. Quint, is that yes? You have a question? No, you just, okay. All right, so then we'll go to community board members and Mr. Du, um, you indicated you had a question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, First of all, I, I just want to say to EDC that the reduction and the removal of parking from this particular project has is problematic for Community Board too, because we were looking for that parking to help us remove all of the permit parking that is in all of the agencies that are downtown Brooklyn. And 
I just need to express that concern because with that parking removal, that is a problem that downtown Brooklyn has had forever, that the solution to which was eliminated when you took away the parking. Uh, yep. My other question is, in terms of the artwork itself, how exactly is that going to be uh, displayed? I, I wasn't clear on what exactly is the next step after you get the information in. What exactly, how does it get displayed? So I can, oh. Sorry, Ricky. No, uh, well, I can start quickly and, and then I can pass it off to Camila. So um, this will be part of wrapping up the design process. Uh, and I know Camila, it's really important to her to get some additional feedback from the community on, on what exactly um, it's going to look like. Um, but the goal is to get all of that feedback uh, incorporated into a final design uh, and then um, there were a number of locations uh, in both presentations where it could possibly go. So it, it hasn't been determined exactly where everything's going to go just yet. But as we finalize design, you know, specific concepts will be matched up with specific locations, but it'll be the ones that are highlighted on, on the maps, which we can share. So I guess one next step, you then come back and represent what your next step or your final step is for a uh, comment by the community board? I'm going to pass it off to Sergio or Kendall. I'm not sure what the next steps are after we get feedback, but I imagine that it, if you guys will have us, uh, we'd be more than happy to share. Yeah, we, we'd be delighted to have you back. Um, I, I did have one quick question. I, I, I assume this is not an issue. I assume this park is all, it's going to be all ADA compliant. I don't have to worry about it, right? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Carolyn. You need to unmute, Carolyn. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I wanted to know if there is any thought of coordination with the next block over on Duffield Place, where there is a whole African American and um, a history that needs to be coordinated. So, the In Pursuit of Freedom uh, project was kind of an outgrowth of the, uh, I guess, original tension between this project happening in the first place and and some of the complicated history surrounding the. The site, the neighboring sites. Um, so uh, we are not directly coordinating with with whatever is happening at any of the neighboring sites. Our main concern is this open space uh, and getting it constructed, and and also living up to the commitment of of having there be uh, a memorial artwork to the abolitionist history of Brooklyn. So the the concept that Camila presented is is you know kind of the fruits of of that commitment to have a a piece of artwork in the open space that commemorates the abolitionist history, but that's separate from anything that's happening outside of the boundaries of, of, of the space itself. Well, you're surrounded by all of these different things that are going on. Yeah, and In Pursuit of Freedom was kind of a multifaceted um, uh, project. It was a collaboration between uh, Weeksville Heritage Center, uh, the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is now merged with BPL uh, and the Iron Dam Ensemble. There were a number of uh, uh, different pieces of that project um, that I'm happy to share more information on, but but this is kind of one piece of In Pursuit of Freedom uh, that's kind of a physical uh, uh, representation of that. Uh, Dwight, you had a question? Uh, yeah, a uh, clarification, please. I um, <clears throat> In the uh, the presentation, uh, Mr. DaCosta, you laid out the <laughs> uh, highlight areas uh, for the art. Now, do I understand you're not going? I mean, it's all going to be text-based installation stuff anyway. <laughs> but do I understand that you're not? You're. We're only going to have one of those areas with a question. Uh, I guess I'd gotten the sense that having these four or five 
different areas highlighted that each of them would have some sort of, you know, question to ponder or something like that. But if you can clarify for me what the story is there, I'd be helpful. Thank you. I think it's maybe somewhere in between, although I see Camille also nodding her head, so so she has but it's those are all the possible locations. It will be multiple things. It, it won't be limited to just one. I don't know if it'll be all of those locations. No, that but it will be more than one. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, do we have any other community board member questions? Or any questions from others who are attending this evening? All right. Well, I, I want to thank you all for being here, and we're looking forward to next steps. And we're looking forward even more to being in that park. So um, uh, thank you for keeping us up to date. Yeah, thank you all for your time, and then we look forward to everyone enjoying it. Okay. So now uh, I want to go quickly to... Uh, yes? Um, is anyone on the committee uh, wanting to present a recommendation for the general board meeting happening this Wednesday? This would be the time to do it. I didn't get the impression they were asking for a um, a recommendation. I, I thought that this was just an update. Um, do you want to speak to that? Uh, it's totally up to you. We are uh, going to the Public Design Commission for their meeting this month uh, on this project. So if you want. To, to send them a letter uh, with a recommendation that's more than welcome. I, I mean, cause we didn't get a, this was really more of the artwork rather than the actual design. What I did quickly see of the design looked very interesting and um, inviting. So um, I don't know, do people feel that they could talk about, uh, would you want a, a proposal on the artwork or a proposal on the design of the park or both? Or um, I, I guess the other thing is we have the concept of the the artwork. We don't actually have the artwork itself. So I do. Um, do board members have some thought? Uh, committee members rather have some thought on this. Dwight, okay. Well, yeah. You know, you know, it seems to me that since we don't really know what the questions are, that uh, which then becomes the text based art, then I mean, because that's the whole process that uh, uh, Mr. that Ms. Rashid has to go through. I mean, it seems the only thing we can do is is sort of uh, support the text based art design given the nature of the park and that sort of work if it's if it's going to be on seating or whatever i mean that that's what it seemed like or uh the, the way the the, the various uh, areas were outlined uh, but that's all we can do because we don't we don't really know conceptually mm -hmm. what you know is going to be the outcome you know from this whatever the second stage of the process is getting you know all of these questions in and and, that, and sorting through that and then ultimately presenting that to the to the design commission right i mean yeah it looked totally up to the board. um uh in any event i will follow up with the copies of the presentations that we uh gave tonight um and you know we can just continue to keep you posted either way okay all right, does, does anyone else on the committee um, have a comment related to uh, whether or not we should? Um, I, I think we're all very interested would, in, in this space and are eager to see it um, completed. Excuse me. Um, I would like to make a comment, probably. Sure, Lenny. Yeah, I live only a couple of blocks from this area, and I have a keen interest in that fault. Um, I like the concepts that I'm hearing. I like the community involvement that the reach out that uh, you are doing. And, and um, it seems very wise, actually, um, considering the history of the um, abolition movement in Brooklyn, um, to commemorate it in such a way where by doing these engravings, 
it, it's not going to, it's just going to feel in my mind as I can see it or picture it, which could be anything but what I really do see. But what I do see is I see a clean image in there. And right now, the park itself, what street, on the street, there's a little piece of that park that's been there for at least a year or so. And it is a very clean, inviting area. And to picture the continuation of what's behind that wall that used to be rubble, um, with this idea, this concept, to me, it is pretty heartening. It's, it, it, it seems that it's going to be inviting, and it's going to be an oasis for people to come and enjoy this area. Not just because this art will stand out, but will be in court. It, it will just draw you in. And uh, so I just want to say I like what I'm hearing. I like this concept. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Um, and, and thank you to our presenters. Now to more mundane things. Um, the, be the approval of the minutes from December 7th. Uh, did anybody have any comments um, or changes for the minutes? Okay. All right. I, I will then assume that by consensus we are approving the minutes as they were presented, uh, which leads me to the chairperson's report. Uh, I want to remind you that uh, next month our meeting is also on a, a, a not a regular day because of a holiday, President's Day. So we'll be meeting on February 8th, and we're going to be talking about community gardens. We haven't done that for a while, and um, I think that's going to be a very interesting presentation. We're also going to hear a, um, a follow-up from uh, Rebecca Faulkner and the Playgrounds NYC. Uh, she has several proposals in the works and um, is coming back to give us an update. It, it looks like <clears throat> they will be doing some event in the spring, in April, probably, and there's a good chance it will be at Commodore Barry Park. So I'm um, eager to hear more about that. And as I said, there's some other things in the works for the fall. In the interim, before that meeting, we are going to have a meeting on February 4th which will be a continuation, it will be a joint meeting with Yekka again, a continuation of the discussion of the statue of Columbus in Columbus Park in front of the courthouse and Borough Hall. Um, as you recall, last time we heard from uh, the Take Down Columbus NYC um, group and we have several other groups uh, coming in, including hopefully a representative from an indigenous group and uh, two of the um, Italian cultural fraternal organizations and um, it would I, I assume the police department and the parks department will also be invited again um, if they if they're available to participate I think it's very important that we um, have this opportunity and he, so that we hear a uh, complete, um, uh, 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 we, we let everyone who has a concern uh, be heard. As you may recall, when we voted on this last time, there were five abstentions. And I think most of those five abstentions came from this, um, from our committee. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity. I can't speak for everybody who abstained, obviously, but I think this is a wonderful opportunity to hear all sides. And there is a possibility that we will get to vote again on this issue. Uh, so I, um, I, I hope as many of you as possible will be both at the February 4th and the February 8th meeting. So we'll be busy. I think there was something else I wanted to mention, but I I, I, I didn't write it down, so um, that's it. Uh, I'm going to open it up for other business. Does anybody have anything for other business? Ms. Quint, yes, Suzanne. Hi, I just wanted to um, highlight to everyone in case they did not see it in the CB2 newsletter, there's two community visioning sessions this week. Um, that regard our district um, tomorrow, Tuesday, and um, I don't know if uh, maybe you want to put some links in. 
Tomorrow, Tuesday at 630, um, there's one regarding Kyler Gore. Um, and Thursday at 630, there's one regarding Green Playground, which is um, in the park in Clinton Hill, I think. I know my, my colleagues are way uh, more geographically proficient than me. <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat that about Kyla Gore? Tomorrow at 630. And I think um, I think Taya was putting going to put it into into the chat. The link for registration. That's a community board meeting. No, it's a community um, visioning session. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take up time. No, 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 not at all. This is important. That's why I'm bringing it up because it actually sort of snuck up on me uh, as well. <laughs> um, we I, had the I, one... I, I, did, I missed that somehow. Yeah, no, I know there was there was one email um, on it, and um, I could probably try to let me maybe while anyone else is going, I can um, source the original email. I'll go back and look at my emails. I'm sorry. I yeah, no, not, a, not at all, Carolyn. I, like I said, it was. Um, the, the fastest place to find details for both meetings is on the CB2 district calendar. I've just put the link in chat and just to brief okay, description. Well, I can't is that, do both at the same time I'm doing this. So <laughs> I'll, I'll look at it as soon as we get off. So um, Council Majority Leader Lori Cumbo with CB2 and the New York City Parks Department invite the public to share and discuss your ideas for two public open spaces. There are going to be two community input meetings. The first is on Tuesday at 6.30 about Kyler Gore Park. And the second is Thursday at 6.30 about uh, Green Playground. So the full details and the registration links are in the district calendar. Okay, I'm sorry. So that'll be, we got emails about that. Okay, They're the I'm emails sorry. that went to the full community. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm it's sorry the emails that went to the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, not, not at all. There was one email that you it could have easily gone past you. Yes, Ms. Chair, we're not able to hear you, unfortunately. You appear to be unmuted. Uh oh. WebEx is not our friend tonight. Could it be because we're beyond eight o'clock? I'm not kicking anybody out. In the meantime, I'll address a question from a member of the public in chat, Ms. Kate Griffler. Um, other business refers to other committee business, but there is at every committee meeting, there's always a section at the end for open forum, and you're welcome to speak to the committee then. Um, Barbara, would you like us to pass the agenda to Mr. Lasterlewski? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, Chair would like us to show the video that they were referring to. Could be tricky. Let's see if this works today. Okay. <laughs> So I will just say a caveat. I, I don't believe any of us have previewed this particular video, but this is 
a video that Ms. Collymore's uh, colleague, Ramona Albert, shared with us to give some context to the Fort Greene playground issue that was discussed earlier. So one second. Okay, not sure how that well this is going to broadcast over WebEx, but we can try. Okay, we're conducting this meeting by text. Um, Vice Chair Andrew Lastowski, if you could um, take the reins from Ms. Um, Zoller-Gringer. I believe her microphone is still out. Let's see. Yeah, I... yeah it appears it's still out. So I think if we're following the agenda, we are prob... Does anyone else on the committee have any other business for the committee? Okay, seeing none. And I believe we have one submission for the open forum, if that's all right. Yes. Ms. Kate Griffler, you have two minutes. Oh, you'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the call. My name is Kate Griffler. I'm the associate producer of Creative Outlet. Um, it's just He's creative outlet, actually. He is a force in the Brooklyn Parks at the Fort Green uh, community. Last year, because of COVID, uh, this arts and organization did a completely free dance program in Fort Green Park at the top of the park and had tons of local dancers and uh, community members, we have uh, all ages join us for free culture classes. I want to announce that we're very excited to be promoting um, Studio in the Parks as we're calling it in three parts for 2021 Park Green Park, Prospect Park, and the Herbert, Herbert King Park. And um, with our staff to last year, our constituents performed at the Black Lives Matter mural. We performed with the Gowanus Arts Walk, and we did a partnership with downtown Brooklyn through their through our thriller presentation for Halloween. And I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, we'll be in three parks, so I wanted to say, um, provide as much as I could in these few minutes. Um, it's going Thursday, 5.30 to 8.30 for 
Friday, 5.30 to 8.30, and Saturday mornings, 11 to 2. We're working with city council members to try to get discretionary funds so we can pay our teachers and pay for the park permits. It's free for the communities. And if there is a way where you, we can partner with you guys to um, provide any type of marketing for us as well, we would, we would love that. I just wanted to quickly introduce myself and introduce the program for next year. Thank you. Andrew, go ahead and, and acknowledge. I'll, I'll step aside. Barbara? Caroline? I had a quick question. I just wanted to understand if this Creative Outlets is the same one that used to be located at 80 Hansen Place? Yes, yes. We moved down to the Arts New York building at 138 South Oxford. It's Jamel Gaines for about the same okay, organization. Yes. Okay. Is there anybody else that volunteered for open session? Anybody else in open session that wants to? Put in their two sets for the community organization. Nope. Okay. Being that we heard all our points on the agenda have been cleared, uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Any seconds to adjourn? Okay. Uh, anybody against adjourning? No, meetings adjourned.